is Sister Neja. And I Sakshi Swarna. We will be your host today celebrating Pi Day March 14. Today is special because 3 upon 14, American format for March 14, represents the first digits of Pi. We honor Albert Einstein's birthday, a renowned physicist, and Stephen Hawking's death anniversary, a celebrated cosmologist. We'll explore what makes Pi so fascinating for mathematicians, but briefly, what is Pi? Pi is an irrational number, meaning it can't be expressed as simple fraction. Unlike square root of 2 or cube root of 7, it's not a solution to any polynomial equation with integer coefficients. This unique property makes Pi truly special. So today the Department of Mathematics is hosting Pi Rock in order to celebrate Pi. Let's begin this awaited event by inviting our guest speaker, Professor Geeta Venkataraman and respected teachers for lightning the lamp. Mathematics, further research in mathematics, 
then you could register for a PhD directly after doing an, an earning an undergraduate degree with research. The other aspect which is new is the fact that uh, students are expected to do some kind of internship. And this internship is, uh, you know, it, it, it's very wide in, the, uh, in its scope. But amongst it are also projects that you can do which are maths related. Right? So, the, so the whole idea then was somehow to, to talk about these aspects as well. So I thought what better than to talk about um, applications of mathematics because that's something that students of mathematics are always concerned about. And we keep thinking, why am I learning so much of real analysis, abstract algebra particularly, where is it getting used, you know, uh, what, after three years or four years of undergrad maths, uh, where am I going to use all the things that I've learned in this period. But the interesting thing that I want to say before, of course, I show you some applications and maybe some, uh, some projects that I myself uh, uh, supervised or mentored with undergraduate students. Um, the important point is that uh, mathematics is a very good way to, uh, to train your brain. Okay? Um, the entire discipline is about, in a way, solving problems. And that's what you do in real jobs. Any job that you go to in real life, uh, your communication skills, your presentation skills, your problem solving ability, your ability to analyze problems, those are what are required. Okay? Um, knowledge you gain as you uh, do in the job. But here you are getting a ready made way of training yourself in all of these things. And I think that is the biggest takeaway that you have to do when you are doing mathematics because all the time we are problem solving, right? When you are even given exercises to do or assignments or even questions in exams, the whole idea is that you have what is what you've learned, what is given to you, and you have the knowledge that you have gathered. And somehow you have to utilize and put all these things together to reach the, uh, you know, the conclusion of the result you're trying to prove or conclusion of the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay? So this method that you're doing, you're modeling all the time actually. And often what you find is that if you abstract things from the concrete problem and then think about it, then you are able to visualize a solution far more easily and which is applicable in a very much larger context than that particular problem that we deal with. So with these words, I will actually start on um, what I hope to convey today, which is discovering the joy of mathematics via applications, projects and research. Uh, I will confess that uh, a large part of it will be applications and then uh, some of it will be on uh, what kinds of projects can be done at the undergraduate level. If you want to do research at the undergraduate level, uh, how do you go about it? Uh, where would you want to publish your results if you actually do manage to do something? So I'll, I'll go over these things. Okay, so the part, first part is looking at applications and uh, so I'm going to talk about what is called the Radon Transform. So Radon discovered it in 1917. Okay? So it's a theorem which is in analysis. And uh, obviously in 1917 when Radon uh, discovered the Radon Transform, uh, it was a result which would be termed as very pure mathematics. Okay. But what you see is that uh, in 1971, the first X-ray computed tomography machine was made. Okay. 
And nowadays we have CTs, CT scan or CAT scan as it, it's called. And this thing, this notion of tomography is based on radon transfer. Okay, so we, in the course of the talk, look at how a result which is otherwise thought of to be in pure mass goes into uh, an application which is so important to health, right? Because uh, any time you want to look inside the human body, not just the bones that you can do via x-rays, but if you need to know, so suppose you imagine that there's a brain surgeon who has to figure out exactly what the situation in the patient's brain is. How does he do it? How does she do it? You can't cut open the brain and check ki kaha garbar ho hai. Okay? You need to somehow be able to see the picture inside the brain and you cannot use invasive techniques. Okay? So somehow the only kind of things you could possibly do is send rays through the, through the brain and what happens when you send a ray, x-ray through the brain? Now, suppose you think of the x-ray as traveling in a straight line. It's passing through different parts of the brain which have different densities, right? So if it's tissue, it has a certain density. If it's blood, it has a certain density. Even within tissues, the densities differ and so on. So the point is when the x-ray passes through the brain, it keeps getting absorbed at different rates. So there's an intensity with which the x-ray enters and there's an intensity with which it exits. And that's about the only reading you can make. Using that, how do you recreate what is inside? Okay? And that's essentially what we will be looking at. And apart from this, this radon transform is, sorry, Radon transform is also used in the airport security machines. It's also used in geophysics. So that's how useful it is. And look at the time frame it has taken. It's taken more than 60 years to figure out that that particular result is useful. Okay, so often you ask as undergraduates, why do we do abstract maths? I mean, all of you would have studied Euler's theorem, right, as part of group theory. It's a very simple theorem. I mean, uh, it's a generalization of Fermat's little theorem, which basically says that if you take any positive integer and a prime p, which does not divide that positive integer, and you take, you multiply a with itself p minus 1 times, then it has to leave the remainder 1 on division by b. And Euler's theorem generalizes this. You know that the, the encryption that is used has been used in the last several decades for all kinds of things, for your credit cards, uh, for making uh, emails secure, and all of these things have, without Euler's theorem, that particular encryption would not have been possible. And Euler's theorem kept discovered here. In fact, it was 60 years may it got done. But Euler's theorem has taken more than hundreds of years before it's got applied. So the point is that you and you cannot do mathematics which can be applied easily without a strong background in mathematics. The only way you will be able to figure out how things can be applied or to actually solve or apply your maths is if you do your maths well. So, coming back to radon transforms, um, so I'm going to talk in particular about computer tomography scan. So, in a CT scan, as I mentioned, a single X-ray being processed through many material, and basically what we can measure is only the overall loss in intensity. And the idea behind tomography is by measuring the changes in the intensity of the X-ray beams in many different directions, 
we might be able to compile enough information to determine what is happening inside okay? the different densities that are there inside. Okay? In some sense, what is happening is that by knowing the value, so I'm now sort of converting this to a maths type situation. Right? So it's like knowing the values of a function on the boundaries and then being able to figure out what the function is like inside that, uh, you know, if it's a planar surface, then you know what is in the boundary, you want to know what is in the interior of that. And in a three-dimensional thing, to think of a sphere, like I know everything on the boundary of the sphere, I want to know what values it takes inside the sphere. So just to, in case, I hope none of you have experienced this, I have, I have. I got uh, MRI done for my oh spine. <laughs> it's, <laughs> for not, it's not a very good, good experience, but uh, hopefully this will work. If my... Uh... A CT scan, also known as a CAT scan or computerized axial tomography, is a painless diagnostic test that uses x-rays and computers to create cross-sectional images of bones and tissues inside your body. Your doctor may recommend a CT scan to examine your body for any of the following. Blood clots, broken bones, cancerous tumors, infections, internal injuries and bleeding, and signs of heart and vascular disease. A CT scan helps your doctor select the correct location for surgery, biopsy, or radiation therapy, check the treatment of cancer or heart disease, and check your condition after surgery. A CT scanner is a large square or round x-ray machine with a tunnel through the center. During your CT scan, you will lie on a table that slowly passes through the tunnel. As you move through the tunnel, a giant ring called a gantry will rotate around your body. The gantry contains a tube that will release x-ray beams and detectors that will measure the amount of radiation absorbed by your body. The x-ray beams will capture many views of your body from different angles as the gantry spins. The detectors will send data to a computer that will create cross-sectional images of the bones and soft tissues inside your body. The scan allows your doctor to see the location of a condition inside your body, which will help them decide how to treat it or to see how well your treatment is progressing. So you can see that um, what this video showed you was that there's measurements taken by sending x-rays all, you know, that ring moves. And then somehow, magically, cross-sections of the brain start appearing in the computer. So what happens between the measurements taken and then it appearing as slices of the brain in the computer? Something must be there inbuilt in the application that they're using or the program that they're using. And that program and that application is what has been built using radon transfer. Okay. So let's look at what uh, that is. So, so the CT scanner makes two measurements. So I'm just thinking along the line. Okay. There'll be multiple such lines that are gathering information. So imagine that the CT scan, one beam is going out here and it's coming out here. I0 is, so X0 will be the point of entry, X1 is where it comes out, and I0 will be the uh, intensity at the time of entry, I1 at the time when it has exited. Okay. So the proportion of photons absorbed per millimeter of the substance. So you have an origin and then you're looking at as you're moving the distance x along that line, 
AX is telling you how much has got absorbed. That's called the attenuation coefficient. And as I said, I0 is the initial intensity and the final intensity is X. So the mathematics is expressed via this equation. It says that the log natural of I0 over I1 is equal to the integral X0 to X1 AX dx. So if you imagine AX as a curve, you are just looking at the area under the curve between X0 to X1 provided your AX is nice enough. Right? But you have to you have to remember that this this x is not the x axis actually that we're looking at. Okay, so these are lines which are parametrized and along the line this is what is happening. Now what is it that the CT scan machine actually uh, measures? Okay, so what it does is that it measures this. So this, this value on the left is what we know. And you have to find AX. Now, the picture here looks like it's just a simple integral. Okay, so I just kind of do a differentiation hopefully and then maybe something will emerge. But that's not, it's not just a normal simple integral. And you have to remember that this x is the points along the line. The line itself is parametrized mm -hmm. and you're looking at lines passing through space mm -hmm. in a sense. Okay? So what where does radon transform come in? So okay, so what is radon transform? So we're going to look at functions of two variables. Okay? So if you want to look at functions of two variables, just imagine the uh, corner of the room as your x-axis, y-axis and z-axis. Okay? And imagine that you've drawn a, um, a little crooked like a circle on the plane okay? which is your x-y plane. Right? And then this function is taking values everywhere in that uh, closed thing that you have drawn. And so it's like a lid. This f of t theta in a way is a lid when you are looking at the t theta axis and the portion of what is there in the t theta plane. Okay. Of course, uh, this entire thing only works if your f is nice enough. Right. Usually nice enough basically will, when we say compact support, the idea is that on, a, on something like a close bounded figure in your uh, plane, th that's where this function will take non-zero values. After that it sort of dies down. Okay? So in your mind you can think about, a, a, you know, I don't know, those uh, cylindrical objects that you have. You can imagine that your uh, bottom has been maybe, uh, it's not so nicely round. but whatever, there is something like that and then there is a lid. Okay? That's the sort of image that we have here. So what is the radon transform? How is it defined for such a function? So the radon transform is measuring, so the, the point is that your, uh, your xs and ys are parametrized in this manner. Okay? So xs, ys is defined as T cos theta minus S sin theta comma T sin theta plus S cos theta as S varies over R and basically the radon transform is defined as this particular integral okay? and it exists provided your function satisfies some good properties. So don't worry too much about you know the detailed technical details because for that you have to learn a lot more analysis. And I will also have to do a lot more preparatory work if I have to tell you in detail about it. But what you ought to remember is if your function is nice enough, we can define its radon transform, which is essentially just a normal integral because we are parametrizing via a single parameter s and we are integrating from minus infinity to infinity 
of that function. So that function will be like a real value function now. And it's, it will come out in a formula involving S and you are then integrating it. Okay, so that's the Raygon transform. And so how does this connect to what we did earlier? So the point is this log natural I0 over I1 which we got from the CT scan, that is like a Raygon transform of AX. Okay? And to solve for AX is like if I know the Raygon transform, how do I find F? That's the analogy that is there. And to actually find F, provided you know, so if you look at RF, the Raydon transform is also a function of two variables, right? It's just that your T and theta are being parametrized and you're finding this is integral here, okay? So the point is that if you know this function R of F, how do you get back F? from it. And for that, sorry, I'm pressing the keys to the Sorry about this. Yeah, so again mathematics comes into play and to solve for F given the radon transform, you need to use Fourier transforms, the Fourier central slice theorem, and then you can find an inversion formula for the Radon transform that will allow us to recover the starting function. So in the CT scan situation, the Radon transform and the process for solving it is used to find A of X from the values that you have learned using the CT scan. So all of this mathematics is coded and programmed into the computer and then the visualization of the function of A of X which you know along every line is put together to create those slices, the slice pictures. So all of this maths has gone in and then it has been programmed into the computer to then present a visual image of what the CT scanner is doing by taking these measurements. And not only that, not just for health, the next picture which I got shown earlier, so this is a 3000 year old mummy. Okay? Uh, they wanted to know what was happening inside the mummy. And they obviously can't unravel it because then the, it's 3000 years old, it may not survive. You don't know things, you might just like in movies and just go to dust, right? So they used a CT scanner to find out what was happening inside. Okay, so you might think this was a story in the 20th century, we are in the 21st century, what now? And the point is that maths never stops and we are constantly improving things. Jyoti experienced the MRI machine and you'll notice that for patients it's, it's not at all a good experience. A, if they want to see inside your body, you are injected with a dye. Okay? It, you can have reactions to the dye. Imagine young people, old people, you have to be still. Because if you shake your head when the thing is spinning, then obviously the readings are not going to be the same. So you have to be utterly still inside that yeah, thing. I was thinking I'm going to die inside the machine. Exactly. The so, that, ha, so the point is, even the short time, maybe it's a five minute, no, it's 20, 20 minute experience. Yeah. Okay, 20 minute in it actually felt like, you know, it's, easy, it's a horrible experience. Imagine if it could be shorter, if this could be done much faster. And in fact, what happens in hospitals is the surgeon is waiting for the latest MRI scan before they can do the surgery. And so the surgeon's time is getting wasted for hours while they are waiting for scans to come via the MRI machine, the latest scans. So this was the situation where enters again mathematics and there is something called the Gauss Prize. So maybe if people have heard of the Fields Medal which is given once in four years 
to mathematicians who have done excellent work, but they have to be below 40 years of age. Okay? And only at most four are given every four years. So it's even more difficult than the Nobel Prize, but that this is the biggest prize that you can get in mathematics. And it's given during the International Congress of Mathematicians, which is held every four years. And there is also the Gauss Prize, which is given, and it's given for research in mathematics that has an impact outside of the mathematical realm, whether it is in technology, in business, or in people's everyday lives. And in 2018, the Gauss Prize was given to David Donohoe of Stanford University. His mathematics on what is called sparse data allowed for faster MRIs. So, David Donohoe was actually a statistician. And uh, his early work was on figuring out what was happening inside the earth. So again, you can't dig. You can't go down and see what's happening. What are the layers like? So what do you do? You send, what, if not x-rays, but probably sound waves, other kinds of things. Then you see it coming back. Then you measure it. Then you get a sense of what's happening inside. But in all of this, this whole idea was that how few measurements do we need to make in a specialized way so that we can get the maximum information out of it. So this was a constant thread in his research and that actually helped him to uh, create faster MRI machines. And it was also a personal reason. His, um, I think his wife had brain surgery his father got prostate cancer, his son was a doctor. So somehow he felt that you know this his work could be used for these things. And in fact, the, the current fastest MRI machines in the world have come out of David Donovan's work. Okay. Uh, again, this works, it's, this is a really nice uh, thing. Uh, so when they give the Gauss Prize... If everything is perfectly organized, I'll start working on my thesis.
gathering data for a shorter period of time. Wallpaper patterns, for example. 
and uh, you know there is a group of symmetry associated with it. What are the groups of symmetry associated with these wallpaper patterns up to isomorphism? Okay. Um, if you are looking at strip patterns, there are seven different strip patterns. Are all the groups of symmetry associated with them non-isomorphic? Or you know, so can you distinguish the, the different patterns by looking at the groups of symmetry? What are the connections? All of these things. Can you create, you know, draw or create each of these patterns? Are there old uh, monuments where, you know, so the, how do you see a wallpaper pattern in an old monument? It's the jali. You know, the jali in the window here. The jali designs are your wallpaper patterns. So it's said that in Alhambra Palace, all 17 of the wallpaper patterns are there. So you can go on a journey of discovery of whether they're there in Humayun's tomb or in Lalkila or whatever you choose. Okay? So, uh, Riman integration. This is something that students learn in, in uh, but I think we kind of learn that if a function is continuous on a uh, closed interval, then it's going to be Riman integrable. Then you learn about if it has certain kinds of discontinuities. Are you still yeah. doing that yourself? Yeah. Then it's Riemann integrable. But it only goes up to a certain point and it stops. So, uh, in fact, this is something that I did with a bunch of students from Stephens some years ago. Uh, and it had first year students, it had it was a mix of students. And I think there was a physics student also who showed up in, in this. And so the whole idea was for them to, to learn about Riemann integration to the extent where it led towards level integration and measure. But the whole idea was that they would be able to say, give a necessary and sufficient condition for a bounded function to be Riemann integration. Okay, so it, it was something that got done. And the students enjoyed it because they were reading something new, something different, and uh, they all had to present. <coughs> so that way you're improving your communication skills, your presentation skills, and you have to write a report at the end of it. You know, so you learn how to write type mathematics, LaTeX, for example. Uh, you learn how to communicate in writing what you have done, and so on. So that was a project that was done. Then, of course, um, you know, if you are looking at simulations, uh, you are trying to simulate. So, even something like, um, you know, uh, today's Pi Day, right? So, there's very interesting thing, simulations that you can do to approximate Pi. So, you take a square, a unit square, one on each thing. Uh, you can put a circle inside, okay? you can calculate the radius of the circle and what you'll, if you look at the ratio of the uh, area of the circle to the area of the square, pi will appear in it. Now how do you use it to get pi? Think of it as you are uh, throwing points at random into this unit square. Yeah. It can either land in the circle or outside it. And then so using probabilistic definitions, you can, it's called the relative frequency method. You can, if you throw a large number of points and you look at the ratio of the number of points that have been thrown to the points that have landed in the circle, you can approximate the value of pi. And you can do these kind of simulations using programming on the computer. Okay? And uh, so again, I mean, so that's something which will bring in some analysis, probability, modeling, and also technology. Graph theory again is, I mean, there's lots and lots of interesting topics, problems that you can do using, uh, you know, exploring using graph theory. And of course, technology. These days, I mean, it's, uh, it's it, 
you know, even when I'm doing research in bags in group theory with my PhD students, I'm constantly telling them use the use a gap program. There's a program for handling groups called gap. Group it's called the groups algorithmic programming. And it has a small library of all the groups up to a certain order. And so the idea is that when you don't know what results are true and you're you know, you're being able to prove it, you think it might have made a mistake. So you want to um, verify it by applying it and checking against those examples, right? So, and you can also get intuition from uh, when you're simulating or trying to see patterns through some form of technology or the other. It can also inform you on what results might be. So these are all things that we can, uh, I mean this is just a small set of things. Uh, I'm advertising <laughs> a book. So this is uh, a book that uh, Junaki Ghosh, she's an LSR, Abdul Habi is in Shivnada University and I. Uh, it is called published uh, sometime. That's my favorite <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jan. So the, the, this is aimed at uh, undergrad and high school. And so the whole idea in this was you learn mathematics, you discover mathematics for yourself by using technology. But again, there are suggestions and various things there which could be used to, to do projects as well. And then, Okay, this is an example that's uh, been done in the Cluster Innovation Center. And um, so this is uh, Professor Shoha Bagai in uh, the Cluster Innovation They did a thing on how far do you have to space the street lights? How do you decide? What should be the space between the khambas which are your street lights? So suppose you know some idea of how high they can be what shape the lighting is going to take, then what's the optimum distance? Because you don't want to place too many of them too close. And modeling problem. It uses coordinate geometry. You can figure out various things. You can take it to the higher levels by bringing in more complications and so on. So again, this is the kind of thing which is sort of experimental. In graph theory, I would like to share the conic we played with the bridges and created something new. Yeah. So that got published uh, in one of the chapters which CPDHE had released. Right. So that is right. a wonderful research. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. So Absolutely. small ideas are leading to very interesting things. Exactly. Analysis. Exactly. You know, uh, so there's, I mean, the point is to be open. And one thing you have to remember is that when you're trying things like this, you will get it wrong. It's only from getting it wrong when you figure out where you, you know, how, where you want wrong in modeling it. You know, maybe this is what should have been done and so on. So, don't be afraid to get it wrong. Even that is a result. You know, so, um, again, continuing with projects. So, this was the, uh, one of the students. Uh, who did that Iman integration project. Uh, he was in his first year and now he's doing a PhD in the University of Utah. So as a first year undergrad, he did this Riman integration, he was part of the Riman integration project. Then he went to Isa Mohadi for his masters and is now doing a PhD. So he, so it was very interesting because young student who wanted to use lot of jargon, right? But as a mentor, then you keep pinning them. Have you understood what you are trying to say and so on? So I think over a period of time, in fact, he and uh, the other student who was there with him, who was also doing the PhD I think, in ISI, uh, Bangalore, they were both first year students and they were doing the last part, which was, uh, you know, heading towards measure, the idea of measure. And they were, they, the first lecture they came, I just kept stopping them at every point. I said, why? 
इसका मीनिंग क्या है यू नो एंड सो ऑन सो दे जस्ट लर्न सो दिस पीरियड ऑफ वेन योर मेंटरिंग सच स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम द टाइम दे स्टार्ट यू विल सी द चेंज बाय द टाइम दे फिनिश एंड इट इज रियली नाइस बोथ फॉर द मेंटर एज वेल एज फॉर द स्टूडेंट्स एंड देर इज अनादर प्रोजेक्ट दैट आई डेट विद a bunch of students uh, one of them was a dst inspired student one was from nicer uh, first year student and so this at that point this enigma movie had come out uh, and also you no know, enigma was much older but this uh, movie about alan turing had come out yeah so so when we looked at the enigma machine and the crypt analysis of the enigma machine how was it broken and uh, this is the abstract that gorish used the student by that that was george shaji um, and this was his uh, abstract so we looked into cryptography in general symmetric key ciphers and so on but um, in this he will analyze the 1930s model of enigma which was actually a machine which it mechanically encrypted and it was a very very difficult machine to break and the thing is that before the english actually managed to break the enigma code the polish cryptographers had already worked on reducing the number of possibilities that needed to be checked and for that they used a very simple result from permutation groups so you know that's among that's a second algebra course uh, in or any group theory course you studied permutation groups and uh, so a simple theorem from that was used to make the job <coughs> easier and so they studied all of these things as part of the project um and now very briefly on the research part of the ig level so radon transforms that i talked about today okay so if you are a fourth year undergraduate who is trying to you know do a, a little bit of research then this this would be a good mri machines and radon transforms and the kind of maths that goes into it would be a good thing for them to to, to work on or wavelet analysis which is what is being used for all this jpeg and the kind of work that in bit does um so if you learn group theory now there's an entire area of research called group theory and cryptography so uh, there are what are called difficult problems in group theory um so doing these things one way is easy but so, uh, you know so an easy example is that if you have a cyclic group okay, so think of zp where p is very large and look at up the multiplicative group which has the numbers 1 2 3 up to p minus 1 under multiplication modulo now that's a cyclic group okay so say you know the generator for that cyclic group let's call it g then you know that every number can be written as g to the power some m a it so chalo g to the power a every number can be written uniquely like that but suppose i pick a number out of this 1 up to p minus 1 and p is very large and i tell you find the a so very difficult even with the computers you cannot do it fast it's called the discrete log problem okay on the other hand if i give you g and i give you a you can calculate g to the power a because you don't actually need to do g raised to the power a you can use modular uh, multiplication and come to it quickly so one way easy other way difficult then there's something called the conjugacy search problem as bahut sare problems hain in group theory which are easy one way difficult another way and then so that's something you can do graph theory and group theory so they you can define very very interesting graphs using group theory okay, so you take a finite group 
and these are graphs whose vertices are your finite group k work uh, elements. And say there's a there's a graph called the commuting graph of a group. Basically, you join two vertices if they commute with each other. So then you study the property of such graphs and so on. You will know, do a lot of work. History of maths. So you talked about Konigsberg bridges problem. You know how Euler actually solved it. He didn't use graph theory. He used matrix theory. No, he just used simple logic. But you can actually go back and read his paper. It's those days when they used to write maths papers, they wrote in English. So that anybody who reads them can actually understand. So you can do things, go back, pick a mathematician, start looking at their work. And uh, and otherwise you can pick up uh, papers from journals which are accessible to undergrads. So for example, the American Math Monkey. And I was looking for a picture to quote and look what I found. Special issue on undergraduate research. So you can go, AMN usually has, I mean these are research articles, right? But there would be research articles with which were hot jada, I mean without I mean, uh -huh. you can still follow the maths or work out the maths. So you could pick up papers like that and get the students to do what is called a literature review. But at a smaller level. This is the kind of thing that used to be done in MPhil. But now, you know, you are bringing it down a bit more. Um, these are some other, uh, the mathematical ESL, the mathematical intelligence, all of these have, and of course, we bring out a journal called Resonance. It's a journal of science education. Uh, it's brought out by the Indian Academy of Sciences. This also has often very good articles <coughs> in mathematics. But you can use that as a starting point to build up. And uh, these are, you know, some journals. That is the link where I found a big list. And some of them are, there's a Missouri Journal of Mathematical Sciences, there's something called Green Hall, and there are many more. Okay, so these are places where you can publish your work, including, and all the ones that I uh, showed you earlier, from where I said pick up papers, there are also places where particularly resonance likes expository articles. So you could, and it's a Scopus Index Journal. So you can always, if you've done something nice with uh, with your undergrad students, you can encourage them to publish there. And of course, along with it, they have to learn about plagiarism, what not to do, all of these things, ethics, everything comes in. I need to stop now. Oh, there's something more. This is the, this is the Euler's, yeah. Original paper in Latin, that's a translation in English. So this is available on the net. Get your students to read. Okay, we are on the stage for a vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. It was indeed a very enlightening seminar. On behalf of the Vice Chairman Council, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to our Professor Vina, ma'am for sparing her precious time from the busy schedule to be with us today on the occasion of International Pi Day. Your knowledge and experience have undoubtedly enlightened us all greatly.